everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Kathy. How are you this fine day? I am beyond excited because we are going to be talking to Dr. Doug Mater about exotic pets. And as you know, and I've mentioned before, Chris, I have a, an affinity for exotic animals. And I worked at Angel Animal Medical Center with two pioneers in avian medicine, Dr. Mitch Petrak, who was the author of Diseases of Cage and Aviary Birds, and Dr. Marge McMillan, who was instrumental in writing the board certification exams for, for veterinarians to become board certified in avian medicine. And so I'm really excited about learning about all kinds of exotics. What are exotics? Who has them? What are their needs? What are their emotional capacities? And I remember the first time I drew blood from an iguana's tail. It was very, very thrilling and very exciting. And mostly because I have felt like this might be the closest I'll ever come to some, an animal, a wild animal, or having a connection with a wild animal. Um, so it was really thrilling for me to have that experience with, with exotics. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about this, Chris. Me too. And, you know, I came from the human side of things. I'm a physical therapist for people. So when I started working with animals about 20 years ago exclusively, I wasn't even really sure about this term exotics and, right. and what that meant. So I do want Dr. Doug to, to talk about that. But as I thought back to some of my earliest memories, you know, I've always said, oh, I have a love for all animals. I think I do. I think I have a, a respect, a healthy respect for, you know, all living creatures in, in our world. But I remember my uncle Jim out on the farm in Iowa going down into the well to do what he needed to do to service the well on the farm. And he would come out with a salamander. And he would always let me, you know, keep it for a day. And then we'd put it back in the well. But you know, I think that was instrumental in my early and probable years. And I think Dr. Doug will help us to, to learn about our symbiosis on this planet. And I'm very excited to get into it. And I think, and I'm going to talk to Dr. Doug about this, that perhaps maybe there is this, and maybe still is this misconception that having exotic animals is uh, easy or inexpensive, or maybe they don't need enough, we need a lot of emotional needs or environmental enrichment. But that that's couldn't be further from the truth. And, you know, I, I have a good friend, um, Megan Terwilliger, who we interviewed recently about grooming. She had an African clawed water frog for 28 years. And um, she committed to that frog for 28 years. And so I'm interested to hear uh, what Dr. Doug has to say about their emotional needs and their environmental needs. So yes, Kathy, as you mentioned, today we will be talking to Dr. Doug Mater or Dr. Doug, as he goes by professionally. And I had to, to actually chuckle when I read his LinkedIn profile, which describes him as a veterinarian, photographer, author, and nice guy. I love that. So <laughs> apparently he's also very humble because he's not just a veterinarian, but world-renowned in exotic veterinary medicine. He is triple board certified veterinary specialist, a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners in Canine Feline and Reptile Amphibian, as well as boarded by the European College of Zoological Medicine and Herpetology, which means that Dr. Doug is amongst the most ambitious, forward-thinking professionals driven by the commitment of well-being for animals and those who care for them. Dr. Doug has been a veterinarian for over three decades. He is an internationally recognized speaker, has written four best-selling medical textbooks about reptiles and amphibians, numerous book chapters in scientific publications, 
and has had long-standing pet columns in newspapers and magazines. He is the recipient of numerous awards given by his peers too. Dr. Mater practiced in California for many years, but today lives and works in the Florida Keys, where he currently concentrates on wildlife and zoo medicine and volunteers with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to help the endangered key deer and manatees. So the focus today will be on exotic medicine within the scope of the veterinary profession, stories from the field, and highlighting his new book, The Vet from Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. So I'm pleased to welcome world-renowned exotics expert and just all-around nice guy, Dr. Doug Mater. That's great. Thanks, Chris and Kathy. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. So Dr. Doug, maybe we could just jump right in and just talk to our audience about what is an exotic animal? Is it everything except for dogs and cats? How do we define exotic? That, that's a really good question. And it, I guess you're going to get a different answer depending on who you speak to. Kind of the definition in veterinary world or in the veterinary schools, you, you nailed it. Uh, you know, anything that's domestic, like a dog or a cat, a rabbit, horse, cow, sheep, pig, those are considered domestics. Pretty much anything outside of that would be considered the exotic or the non domestic. So, Certainly a snake, an alligator, um, birds, um, you know, ferrets, hedgehogs, things like that. So it seems like there's now kind of these subcategories, if you will, within exotics, because you mentioned some there, like these subspecialties of pocket pets, avian medicine, with like primates, things like that, all be part of exotics? Oh, they sure would be. And um, again, you know, some of them like ferrets, you know, they're, they've been used alongside of humans for years not so much as pets. They originally, they started out as hunting animals. So the, the more the animal has evolved, so to speak, with the human, the closer they are and the better the relationship it is. You had mentioned earlier about having an iguana and uh, you can tame down an iguana, but being tame isn't the same thing as being domesticated. Domestication is something that takes decades and decades uh, you know, of evolution. So having a, a tame iguana it's still a wild animal. And I, I think you nailed that when you said that. Uh, before we move on, what are some of the most common exotics, I guess, period, and the most common exotics that, that you've had the pleasure of treating? Well, I've treated pretty much everything. But I think in, in terms of the pet world, um, just, you know, take a walk into most of the pet stores and you're going to see the parakeets, the cockatiels, the canaries. Some of the bigger bird stores will sell things like, you know, macaws and, and Amazons some of the smaller parrots. And then in the reptile world, I think the smaller snakes like the corn snake, the ball python, certainly the um, bearded dragon, I think is considered the most popular reptile pet right now, but also little things like leopard geckos make great starter pets. So there's, there's quite a few out there. And then in the small mammal world, a lot of people have rabbits, ferrets, hedgehogs, hamsters, that kind of stuff. Guinea pigs, What's, my favorite. Yeah, guinea pigs, oh, yeah. guinea pigs, yeah. What's the most uncommon animal that, that you would say you've treated? Ha, um, I get that question a lot. Definitely by far, and I've only, only treated one as a pet in almost 40 years, and that was a Congo fire eel. I got a house call call one time. Uh, a woman had her Congo fire eel, fire eel wasn't eating properly. And, you know, at first I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, sometimes when people describe what they have, it may be spot on. Sometimes it's quite far from the truth. And in this case, it was actually true. So I showed up at her house. I had two students with me. And sure enough, she had a Congo fire eel living in her bathtub. And she had had it in her bathtub for 16 years. Oh, and boy. all she noticed was that suddenly it wasn't eating. Well, the bathtub is not the natural environment for a Congo fire eel. But somehow she managed to keep it alive and keep it thriving for that long of a time. And sadly it had gone into heart failure. And how do I know oh. that? Because I've seen thousands of fire eels. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just uh, <that> <laughs> yeah, I've seen a few eels. But I don't think I've ever seen a Congo fire eel before. But once we did our exam, I mean, we I always stress this with my students. If you want to be a good exotic veterinarian, you need to be a good a veterinarian first. You got to learn your dog and cats because that's where you learn your heart disease and your eye disease, your skin disease. You learn your penicillins and you learn all the different drugs. Then you extend that by subspecializing and, and looking at exotics. So we looked at this eel in the bathtub and actually we were able to do an ultrasound just like they do in people and dogs and cats. And we determined that there was fluid around the heart. And um, 
it's not like you can pick up a book and look up doses for Congo fire eel heart disease. You know, it's, just not, <laughs> it's not out there. So, you know, we tried to come up with doses based on our best guess from other species and the animal lived a few days and then perished. But mm. it was quite sad because um, you were talking about having your friend having the frog for 20 something years. She had this eel for 16 years in her bathtub. It was part of her life. She had a bond with it. Megan had flounder since she was a child, and uh, she named him after something in The Little Mermaid. And she was devastated when he died because they were they were bonded, or she she adored him and took very good care of him because he lived way beyond what his life expectancy was. I think of ten years, but you know it makes what I was going to say previously is I think that you know when we were talking in the introduction that there's a misconception maybe that having an exotic animal is either one easy or cheap or they don't require a lot like you know you go to the i can get a guinea pig you know right now the pet store for probably 30 dollars. but am i going to be able to care for that animal appropriately you know without education and, and knowing what that animal's needs are do you think that people are getting animals like this and sort of under this misconception that they're not going to live very long and they don't require very much well again that's a well, that's a multifaceted complicated question Guinea pigs aren't real long life, uh, like a like for instance, even compared to a dog or a cat. But uh, look at the frog that lived over twenty years. Hermit crabs, you can buy them at, at, at any store as you travel up and down the Florida Keys where I live for a couple bucks. And if you properly care for it, a hermit crab can live 25, 30 years. You mentioned the frog and and how people don't appreciate the relationship you have. I had a pet frog for eighteen years, and it died of kidney cancer. And you know what? I don't take the frog out and sit it on my lap and watch TV, and I don't take it for drives in my car. But every single day for 18 years, I watered it. I took care of it. I turned on slights. I talked to it. It always listened to me. It never talked back. It never was judgmental. <laughs> and th there was a bond. And when that frog died, I cried. You know, it's, it's stupid, right? Because I'm, I'm a grown man. I shouldn't cry. It's a frog. No, it's not a frog. It's part of my life. And I do think that people do established legitimate, solid, hardcore human animal bonds with exotic pets. Now, mm -hmm. getting to your question about money, I also have pet snakes. These are gifted to me by clients and I have one snake. Uh, I don't know how old it is. I got it as an adult, but I, you know, I travel a lot and I teach a lot. So I can throw a mouse in the cage, you can eat, and then I can travel for a week and come back and it's fine. I, you, you can't do that with a dog or a cat. You have to have a house sitter or board it. So some animals are very low cost, very low maintenance, and some exotic pets, uh, like a monkey, it's like having a two-year-old for the rest of your life. So right. you really need to do your homework before you run out and impulse buy something like this. If you get yourself an African Grey or an Amazon, you could be looking at 70, 80 years of care for an animal that you might not outlive and have really significant environmental requirements for their emotional health. Uh, birds are incredible. I mean, if you look at them anatomically and physiologically, they've got the largest cerebral cortex of all the vertebrates that we hang out with. And they have very complex personalities and, and they're very attuned to their owners. And you also brought up another extremely important point, and that is end of life. And I'm not talking about the pets, I'm talking about yours. And I have two pet tortoises right now, excuse me, three pet tortoises and a macaw. And I have to have it set up in my will that when I'm gone, what's going to happen to them? And it's not as simple as like, okay, I'm going to give them to the shelter. I'm going to give them to the zoo. I'm as bonded to those animals and they're just as, as bonded to me as I am to them. So what's going to happen to my macaw who I've taken care of every day for the last 30 years? And let's assume I'm around for another 20. When I'm gone, she's going to pine. She's going to, she's going to have a rough time because I won't be there for her anymore. And you can't just say, okay, we'll just kick her off to the zoo and they'll be fine. No, it's yeah. not going to be the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's family. I think the American Veterinary Medical Association, there, there are several organizations, you know, the SPCA, and they've all done studies and surveys. And, you know, do you have pets in your family? Do you consider your dogs and cats and birds and snakes as part of the family? And depending on what study you look at it, anywhere from 60 to 90% of people say, yes, our pets are our family. And then if you look at the subset of that, how many of those pets that you consider part of the family, do you consider them as child substitutes? And one recent study I just read said 36% of people consider their pets as child substitutes. So Dr. Doug, I'm going to pivot a little bit here. And this is a loaded question. Okay. Do you have a favorite exotic? 
I have to say it's changed over the years, but since I've lived in Florida now for nearly three decades, I think it's the alligator or the crocodilians, but <laughs> I really love alligators. <laughs> They're so prehistoric and, you know, I mean, they've been around for 300 million years and they make me look good because they don't get sick. And when they do, they're so tough. Even if I mess up, they still tend to get better. So I just take credit for it. Well, given that, tell us the story of Splitjaw. Oh, Splitjaw. That's not the brightest alligator. Well, first off, you have to understand, if you look at your hands, hold your hand up in front of you right now, everybody that's listening, and look at your pinky finger and look at the very last digit, which is the last segment of your pinky finger. Right. That's about the size of the brain on an animal that weighs 250 pounds. So they, they don't have a real big mental engine. Um, but what they do have, they're able to process quite a bit. But Split Jaw, he, he's the little dog and he's the big dog in a little dog body. So where he lives, he always thought he was like the alpha male. And so he got into a fight with a bigger gator one day and broke his jaw right down the middle, right below the nose. And the owners of the facility rushed him down to my hospital and we were able to put a screw and wire the jaw shut and fix it, did just fine. Fast forward several years and he's feeling pretty tough again. And he got into a new pond, ran into a new alpha male, got into it again. This time the alpha male bit him through the lower jaw and snapped his jaw in half, not down, not down the front, but on the side. Ooh. So again, these people that I work with that have these gators, they love these animals and they rush it down to the hospital. We anesthetize it. I put a $750 titanium plate in it and each screw was $25. So I plated his jaw and the jaw finally healed. Now the owners are smart enough. Split jaw has his own paddock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he doesn't Sounds have best. to battle for sovereignty anymore. But uh, he's doing remarkably well. When I first met him, he was about 80 pounds. I just saw him last week, and he's almost 300 pounds now. Wow. Are they territorial like, like that? Is that their, their territorial? Um, they're Definitely the males are territorial, no question about it. But the big thing is most of the fighting that they get into is involved over food. Mm -hmm. It's uh, whoever's bigger and faster and gets to it first generally gets it. And if two animals go for it at the same time, whoever's got the bigger jaw ends up winning. And and that was featured, uh, at least that first uh, surgery that you were talking about, uh, was on Gator Boys on Animal Planet. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. you saw that. And you can that find that. Those exactly. It's on YouTube online for those of you who want to search for that. It's a pretty cool story. Yeah, it was. So my second loaded follow-up question is, you know, we kind of touched on this, but many exotics are not native, you know, especially to us here in the United States. They're imported. And... I know that you live near the Everglades and the Everglades has become a huge dumping ground for a lot of these exo exotics. And I recently learned just this past year about the annual snake roundup. How do you feel, Dr. Doug, about this ethically, morally? Can you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Well, you really like to push the buttons today, don't you? <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 the situation with the invasive exotics in South Florida has sadly really gotten out of hand. And just, I'll get back to your specific question in a second, but just to give the, the listeners a, a overview, we have, everybody's heard of the Python invasion in the Everglades. Uh, we also have the, now the black and white tegu, which is a large Argentinian lizard that's gotten into the Everglades. That's significant because they're egg eaters and they get into the nests and they eat the eggs of the endangered American crocodile. We have the lionfish, which are an Indo-Pacific fish, somehow got into the Atlantic Ocean, and now they're found all the way up from New York south down, you know, to the Southern Caribbean. So Jamaica, Caymans, all those islands down there. And of course, here in the Florida Keys, they're everywhere. And they're just devastating the small reef fish that live on our coral reefs. And here in the Florida Keys, the big animal that everybody hates is the green iguana. And in the other 48 states, and I'm saying 48 because Hawaii doesn't have them, people in um, Alaska have a lot of pet iguanas. They're real common there. But in all the other states, they're very loved pets. But in southern Florida and the Florida Keys, my God, they're, they're a scourge. And the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Committee has actually put out a bounty on them and made it legal to kill them year-round without permits or licenses. So... Yeah, so I, that hopefully that kind of explains how bad it is. So getting back to your question about the, the derbies, 
how do I feel about it? Well, going back four decades when I was in college, I had to pay for my own college. I was a blacksmith, so I used to shoe horses, but that didn't quite cover the bills. So I also worked as a waiter and I also bred pythons. Ugh. I just admitted it. I could be part of the reason there's so many pythons all over the place. Because when I was in college, I had a seller and I had 67 pythons in there and I was breeding them and I was selling them in the pet trade. But this is back when pythons were so cool. So they are kind of near and dear to my heart. And when I hear people going up and chopping their heads off and whacking them with hoes and all that kind of stuff, it, it, it hurts. But at the same time, I understand that they are an invasive species and they're wreaking havoc to the native wildlife. There have been plenty of published studies that look at the local mammal populations up there and the possums, the raccoons, you know, the anything, a small deer, I mean, you name it, and they're just getting wiped out. And in some places where there used to be ample populations of these animals, they're gone. They're completely gone. So the pythons are a problem and they need to be eradicated, but the reality is they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. So what the derbies are is usually two or three times a year, they host these derbies and they turn people loose and whoever gets the biggest python wins a prize, whoever gets the smallest python wins a prize, whoever gets the most python, pythons win a prize. They also have bounties on them and there are snake bounty hunters that will go out year round. They have to, they have, to have permits to do it, but um, I don't think it even costs anything to get the permits, but don't quote me on that. And they, once they catch the python, they turn it into the state and they get paid per foot of python. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's good if it's done humanely. I don't like to see any animal suffer, whether it's a pest or not. I don't think animals should suffer. So if they're, if they're caught and euthanized humanely, I don't have a problem with it. You have to remember that a lot of these animals that are considered invasive exotics, a lot of people have them close to their hearts and their pets. I'll have somebody bring me a... a I think of this lady who brought me her sick iguana that had a broken leg and I did orthopedic surgery on it. The bill was a couple thousand dollars by the time it went home. And then the same day, somebody brings me an iguana that was shot through the head because they found it on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then they take these iguanas, they grind them up and, and use them as lobster chum and put them in traps. So you get the entire spectrum from left to right. Oh, you know what? It's funny because if it, there was a study done by one of the tourist industries and they looked at social media posts. And what are the, can you guess what the three most popular animals are that are photographed in the Florida Keys every single year? It's got to be iguanas, chickens, and roosters. <laughs> no, iguanas, well, roosters are chicken. So iguanas, chickens, and keter. And keter Those are yeah. the three most photographed animals in the Florida Keys every single year. And so when the tourist advocacy groups are talking about mutilating and destroying iguanas, that doesn't send a good message to our, our listeners and our potential visitors from other areas. They go, why should I do an eco tour, eco-friendly tour to the Keys where they just kill all my pets? It's, it's sad, but it does happen. But there are a lot of them. I mean, they're, they're nuisance animals. Well, can we go back to kind of the root cause and maybe the education? Because again, I think this speaks to people just not making impetuous decisions about a pet. You know, Kathy's point early on, you know, oh, you can buy this inexpensively, you know, at, at the local pet store. And then your child grows tired of it. Um, you know, you don't want to care for it anymore because you didn't do the research. The iguanas, it's there's a lot of fuzziness about that. You know, they, they're blamed on released pets. But reality is, you know, were they animals that were caught in the wild and then released were the animals that were brought in from California and then released. The fact of the matter is that. The Florida Keys are in their actual native, mo northernmost native habitat, if you look at the iguana distribution maps. And they do raft between the islands, just like Darwin's finches did. Mm. And after Hurricane Wilma in 2005, we have a small set of islands called the Dry Tortugas, which is about 70 miles west of Key West. And it's a, it's a wildlife preserve for very endangered waterfowl. And the only place in North America where the great frigate bird will ground nest, it's the only place. And so that isle, those islands are monitored closely by fish and wildlife. After Hurricane Wilma, which traversed westward across the Southern Caribbean, did a U-turn over the Ekanam Peninsula in Mexico for about two or three days, and then shot back east over the Dry Tortugas. The very next day, when the biologists went out to check the islands, uh, they found iguanas everywhere. 
So mm-hmm. these animals were actually blown over from the Yucatan Peninsula. Oh my So gosh. we know that there is native natural migration of these animals from island to island. That's, that's a given fact. The reality is that we're reverse habitat encroachment. Instead of cities moving in and wildlife moving up to the hills, people move into the Keys, they go to Home Depot, they buy beautiful plants and flowers and iguanas are folivores, which means they eat leaves and flowers. And so you go put a beautiful bougainvillea or a hibiscus in your yard, all the iguanas are gonna to come to your yard and eat. Hey, if you right. go and throw some Krispy Kremes in your driveway, I'm gonna be over there in a minute. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's basically what's happening. So to answer your question, I think early that you asked about people letting exotics go, it does happen. People, mm-hmm. exotics are cool, okay? Right. They have something called a cool factor. And the higher the cool factor, A, more people want it, and B, the more the pet stores can charge for it. And the inverse is the higher the cool factor, oftentimes the less you know about it. After, you know, people go to the store and they see a hedgehog or they see, uh, I'll never forget when the butterfly agamas came out, which are a really beautiful lizard. They were selling like crazy. And people would get them home. And of course, you buy the animal and then you go home, you go, where am I going to put it? Oh, let's throw it in this box. Or, hey, we've got an old aquarium in the garage. That's mm-hmm. not appropriate housing. And certainly it's not appropriate feeding. And the butterfly agamas were selling for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And they're absolutely beautiful lizards. They, they call them butterfly agamas because they spread out their rib cage and then they're colored. So they look like butterfly wings when they spread out. Mm. And people were buying them. And then trying to feed them things like mealworms and crickets, which are the, the, the standard go-to, uh, let's feed my lizard thing from the pet store. Mm-hmm. But as it turns out, these animals ate slugs. Their natural diet was slugs. Well, nobody has slugs in their refrigerator and pet stores don't sell slugs. And these lizards wouldn't eat crickets and grasshoppers and, and mealworms. And they all ended up starving to death within a few months mm-hmm. and dying. Mm-hmm. So the, the craze fortunately faded out after about six months. But man, a lot of animals had to die in the process. And then anytime I think that there's something that we see that shows up uh, in the movie theater or, you know, like when 101 Dalmatians came out, then all of a sudden there were, you know, whole plethora of Dalmatian puppies that people didn't do their research on before they oh, come. Oh, yeah. I mean. And then they become, yeah, and they become popular and then we over we overbreed them or we overextend and then we abandon them. Sure. I mean, look at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I can't tell you how many turtles came in, you know, right after those movies came out. And then when Jurassic Park came out, everybody ran out and bought an iguana. When Rio came out about that big uh, macaw, you know, everybody wanted to get one until they realized that the price tag was about $25,000 a piece. And that didn't take off too well. No, I mean, like like you say, anytime there's a fad, everybody wants to run out and get it. And then Marley and me came out, everybody ran out and got a golden retriever. Without without really truly preparing for what that means, right? Um, I'm wondering if that if the the cool factor is certainly I think what drives us sometimes to get pets. But do you think there's something else or like what is drawing us to connect with a reptile or a bird or a ferret? What what draws us to that? Usually the reptiles. It's almost always a macho image type thing. Not always, but I would have to say, at least in my experience, that's that's a big part of why people want to buy reptiles. I mean, people do rep- buy reptiles because they appreciate the animal. They want to take good care of it. And they know that if they take care of it well, a lot of reptiles can live many, many, many years. Birds, you know, they make great companions. They're, they really are interactive. Small mammals are easy to keep if you live in a high density apartment building because you don't have to run home from work at lunch to take them to, for a walk. So, I mean, there's a lot of advantages to a lot of different species, and you just have to kind of look at the given situation. Some animals work really well for some people. Some animals are an absolute bust for others. So what drew you to exotics, Dr. Doug? It seems like, yeah, so (laughs) you you started this early in your career and, you know, definitely has had specialized in their care. the cliff notes, okay? Okay. Um, (laughs) I was born in the Upper Keys. My grandparents bought built third house on the island where we lived. And so when my parents got married, they bought the house from my grandparents and our house backed up to a mangrove swamp. So I spent my young childhood period growing up, playing in the swamp, learning about birds and slimies and creepy crawlies and all that kind of stuff. Uncle Sam took my dad away to Vietnam. We were transferred to a military base in Hawaii while he was off fighting in Vietnam. And while I was in Hawaii, they really don't have, well, there's no snakes. There's, they don't have all the creep crawlies that I grew up with. And long story short, my older sister liked horses. And I didn't particularly care about horses. But 
the stable where she kept her horse, it was required that the man of the family had to go do four hours a month of maintenance. And since my, my dad was in the away in the army, I had to go to the stables and take care of the fences and stuff. Then I noticed that all the girls would drool and go crazy over the blacksmith when he would come out and get all sweaty and shoe their horses. And I go, I can do that. So when I was 15, I moved away. I went to blacksmithing school, got my blacksmithing degree, moved back to Hawaii and opened up my own blacksmithing business. And I started working with the local veterinarian and he would have me make special shoes for horses with injured feet. And these are horses that were going to end up in the glue factory and I could make a shoe. And with the guidance of the veterinarian, we could take this horse and it would be functional again. And I'm going, hey, this is really cool. I can actually do something with my own skill set and I can help this animal have a normal life. And then I go, you know what? I can either break my back as a blacksmith for the rest of my life or I can go to vet school. So that's how I ended up going to vet school. I still liked exotics, but then I'd fallen in love with horses. So I had originally intended to be a, an equine veterinarian. When I was in graduate school, I got run over by a drunken driver. And one year and like 11 surgeries later, I just didn't have the strength left to work with horses. And in my recovery periods, I started volunteering at the zoo ward. And so that's making a long story short, uh, how I started working with exotics. But you've had quite a colorful life, Dr. Doug, and this seems like a natural segue into talking about the vet from Noah's Ark. So well, thank you. I started reading and I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, but you share some of that as you, you know, the, the book opens. And so can you tell us like what inspired you to write that book and some sure. of the war stories from that time and so forth? Oh, you got it. So when I was working with this veterinarian and the horses, he saw my interest and he realized that I had a passion for animals. And so he gave me a copy of James Harriet's book, All Creatures Great and Small. And that did it. Boy, that sealed the deal. I read that and then I found out he'd written several others. So I ended up reading the whole series, the All Creatures series. And that's what made me decide I really wanted to go to veterinary school. So I had told myself two things when I went to vet school. One, I would never work on small animals. And two, I would never, ever, ever live in a city. So fast forward to uh, the vet at Noah's Ark. What am I doing? I'm living in Los Angeles, working in a small animal hospital, right? Mm -hmm. so that, that just goes to show you that you have to be flexible. Um, that car accident just turned my world upside down. And I either could have just, you know, been the victim and quit altogether or take the cards that life dealt me. And so I did. I just decided to go ahead and continue my veterinary work. And I had a very good friend that uh, was a veterinarian and he was tired of working where he was working. So we, we knew we both loved the water and we wanted to have our own hospital and, and be our own bosses. So we started looking for practices from Santa Barbara down south to the border. And um, when you're buying a used hospital, it's not like you like buying a car that you can go out and test drive a bunch of them. And we didn't have a ton of money because I was just out of school and he'd only been out for a couple of years. So we ended up buying this rundown, beat up hospital in the really, really poor part of town that needed a ton of work. And, but we figured, you know, some of the best restaurants in the world are in the worst parts of town. So here, here. if they can do it, we can do it. So we went ahead and bought the place and he and I took turns working at the local emergency clinic every other weekend. And we split the money we made so we'd have enough money to eat. And you know, all the money we made in the hospital, we put back into remodeling it until we built this really nice hospital in the middle of a really crappy part of town. So, Dr. Doug, can you share with us some of your most interesting cases or memorable stories that you have from uh, sure, practicing? Sure, sure. I'd be, be glad to. I think what I tell people is, you know, the, the book is, in the literary world, it's classified as a memoir because I wrote the book and it's about a period of my life. I don't like to think of it as a memoir. I like to think of it as a story about the human animal bond told in the first person. And I happen to be the person driving the bus. My favorite story in the book is the story of the human animal bond and, and how this amazing team that I worked with in my hospital sacrificed themselves literally every day. And especially during the times of the unrest surrounding the Rodney King riot, still willing to come into work and take care of sick patients when there were people literally dying all around us. Um, I don't want to be a, a you know, buzzkill and, and give away any of the story, but there are some scenes in the book that are pretty graphic. And, you know, the riots were nothing nothing to, to laugh about. They were very serious. And the, really the sad thing is if you take away the 1992 and the name Rodney King, that story could be anywhere in USA today. You know, the, but the real... 
the real winner in this story is the human animal bond and the human animal bond, the interaction people have with animals. You can read the Harriet books or look at a series on PBS, the same human animal interactions that he had back in the fifties and sixties we have today. And people love their animals and what people will sacrifice to keep that bond strong is amazing. And I, I was so fortunate. I wouldn't be here today if I wasn't surrounded with such an amazing, caring, compassionate team. And that's how the, the book came about. And the whole book is about a, an anthology of stories about various clients that I had during that time. And I think the real superstar in the book is my dog, Walk. He was a rescue chow that I got when I first moved to the key or first moved to Los Angeles. And he was my best friend and confidant. My, my wife was an emergency room nurse. So we had 180 degree opposite schedules. Uh, basically, I would get home and she'd be gone to work and I would leave in the morning and she'd just be getting home. So my best friend in the world was my dog. And we go on walks every night and I tell him my deepest secrets and he'd always listen to me and give me advice in a dog way and never pass judgment. And he was always there for me. And even one scene, I don't want to give it away where he literally saved my life. He's just a pretty incredible incredible dog. And it's kind of like Marley and me or Art of Racing in the Rain. People love good animal stories. You know, I like I said, I'm, I'm partway through it. But to our listeners out there, I mean, obviously, as you're listening to this podcast, you can hear the passion and the eloquence by which Dr. Doug speaks. And that definitely carries through in his writing. So I have laughed. I have cried. I have been gripped since I picked the book up. And uh, I encourage all of you to, to check it out. We'll put uh, links in our show notes and things like that so that you can read it for yourself. Well, thank you. It's very kind. And Dr. Doug, are you, I, I understand that you're actually certified in the human animal bond. Is that correct? It is. The North American veterinary community offers a 30-hour course on certification in human animal bond study. It's like a graduate level course. And I took that because I, I've always said this since the day I started my practice. The reason I get up in the morning is my goal is to do whatever I can to promote and prolong the human animal bond because it's so incredibly important. Now that I'm certified, it doesn't change my goal. It just helps me understand it even better. But I, I do think it's incredibly, incredibly important. I think every veterinarian and every animal health nurse and everybody that works on an animal health care team has that same passion about prolonging the human pet bond. That's why we do what we do. But I really can't stress enough how important it is. And I look at how that bond has changed people's lives, anywhere from personalities to career choices. Uh, the, the classic example I like to, to, to share with people is I had a young couple, and uh, this was back a few years ago. They didn't have any children, but they had a pet iguana. And that iguana was part of their family. He was an IT, a computer whiz, kind of like a Mark Zuckerberg or somebody like that. And he was offered a job in Australia in the seven-digit salary range, okay? I mean, that's a ton of money. And when he found out that he couldn't bring his iguana with him to Australia because of their import rules, he turned the job down. Wow. And wow. I have clients who have told me that they've, um, they continue to do things like make sure they take their medication or make sure they take care of their mental health. Um, or maybe even, you're right, change careers because, or quit their jobs even to stay with their animals. And then I think the other thing that's important is the human animal bond isn't just with your dog or your cat, like we discussed before. You could have that human animal bond with like my friend Megan and her and her frog, Flounder, or, or a fish, or I have a, I have a client who was a dove who lived into her 30s and this woman cared for her every single day. Um, of her life and they Absolutely. got yeah and they got she got a lot out of it too the, the dove certainly did that's for sure and so did the owner no it, it goes both ways and so yeah you know maybe that dove like i said before with my frog that dove may not sit on her lap when she's watching tv or go for car rides on a sunday afternoon but that dove is there for her every day that she needs she comes home from work she's had a bad day she talks to the dove the dove never makes her feel bad the dove never passes judgment the dove never criticizes her and it's it's part of that that relationship that keeps us going. That's why people have small pets in apartment buildings like mice and and canaries and and fish because they they need somebody to talk to. You mentioned before, um, well, I guess you mentioned as you were talking about the human animal bond. So I think I remember reading something online about your take on the human animal bond, Doctor Duggan, and it wasn't just with their particular pet. 
but also a broader view. You mentioned something about, you know, also that bald eagle that you may see flying. And I just had that experience. We've just moved to the water up here in the Northeast and we had an incredible cold snap and we lost heat and it was 41 degrees in our house. But I looked outside and there were three bald eagles fighting over a fish on the ice. Wow. And it was just so, so cool. So can you talk about kind of the bigger perspective? And also, I know you're very much an advocate for the ecosystem and the environment and, you know, plastics and all of that stuff. You know, the human-animal bond is, is not just with pets. Um, as you said, you saw the birds and they were fighting over a fish. and there's a Bob Seeger song. I don't recall the title of it, but one of the lines in the song is he was riding his motorcycle across the country and he gets to the, he gets to the Continental Divide and he looks up and he sees a young hawk flying and his soul begins to rise. And that's so true. You know, he may never meet that that hawk in person, but when you see a beautiful animal like that, it just lifts you up. And you know, one of the classic examples is I belong to a photo club and Usually about once a month, we take a weekend walk and we go to one of the hardwood hammocks and we walk around with our cameras and binoculars. And typically, you know, you'll you'll see certain birds in certain places because they're territorial. And I remember watching, we had a, a migrating pair of bald eagles that were coming down every year and they built a nest and we were watching it, watching it, watching it. And then all of a sudden one day, the one of the eagles was gone. And it turns out it flew into a power line and broke its wing. Well, fortunately... I guess, fortunately, it ended up coming to see me and I was able to fix it. But the day that we went out there or the day that the photo club went out there and they looked up and the bird was gone, it broke their heart. This is like, where is he? You know, he's, he should be here. We look forward to seeing him every month. And then he came to me. We were able to fix him, get him to fly again, release him. He went back up because they made for life. And then the photo club went out there a couple of months later after he was released and saw him again. And it was like everybody doing the happy dance. So it's amazing how people can bond. And even look at children in zoos. They go to the zoo with their class out, you know, their class field trips, and they watch the baby giraffe grow up. And, you know, again, that bond is there. And then all of a sudden, the giraffe is gone. Well, what happened to it? Or the hippopotamus has a baby. What do they do? They have a name the baby contest. And it involves the community, involves all the people. So people love animals. I mean, animals are a huge part of our life. Stretching over to the pollutants and doing our part there, can you share the story of the whale shark under the bridge and how you almost died? <laughs> yeah, it's always been one of my dreams to go diving with a whale shark. I never thought in my wildest dreams that it would be diving one to save its life. There's a, Our island chain has 43 islands connected by 42 bridges. And when the tide changes, the water rushes under these bridges, sometimes six, eight knots an hour which is so strong, you can't, as a person, you can't swim in it. But these whale sharks are filter feeders, which means as they swim, they open up their mouth and then water flows through their mouth across their, their gills and across their, their feeding parts in their mouth. And then they filter out the, the plankton and everything else. Where there was a young whale shark, and when I say young, it was still about 25 feet long, that learned it could park itself underneath this bridge and when the tide would change, it didn't have to go anywhere. It just sat under the bridge and opened his mouth and the water would rush through his mouth. And then during the slack tide, it would turn around and face the other direction and the water would come back in the other direction. It would just sit there and eat. And it drew a lot of attention from all the tourists and the locals. And they looked over the bridge one day and they saw that it had a big rope wrapped around its tail. Well, that's not good because it wraps around the pedicle of the tail. If it gets too tight, it can cause constriction and blood loss and the tail can fall off and it'll die. So Fish and Wildlife called me because I was up at the Turtle Hospital. We went out with the local fishermen and we were able to find the whale. And I dove in. I, I was free diving because I didn't think I'd need tanks. And I grabbed the rope. And as soon as I grabbed the rope, the whale went into a dive and started diving down. And I didn't want to let go because I knew if I let go, I'd probably not get another chance at it. So I just kept cutting and cutting and cutting until I finally cut through the rope. And when I got the rope off the tail, I started to swim up and I didn't realize how deep I was. <laughs> I ran oh. out of air on the way up. <laughs> oh, and no. Somehow I managed to make it to the surface and didn't die. But I thought for sure I was a goner. But at least if I had died, I had died doing something proper. You know, you have to have a certain amount of, of fearlessness or does, does your passion, I guess, for what you do just override that? 
you know, and then as a, as a transition, how many times have you been bitten or injured in your career? Uh, you know, let's, you- let's start with A before we go to B and C. Okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't think I'm fearless at all. I like to think that I have what's called horse sense, which means that I pay attention to the animal and I read their language and I know their biology and their behaviors and I don't do stupid things. Answer B is a lot of my friends probably think that I'm not fearless. They just think I'm stupid or crazy. <laughs> um, but the honest answer is when I work with these animals, I surround myself with professionals. We don't do the rodeo cowboy stuff where we beat them with sticks and slap them with ropes. We work with conditioning and respect. And we use that concept called the fear-free concept where the goal is to work with the patients or the, the animal's natural behavior so we don't stress it. If you stress an animal, you're going to induce the fight or flight response. That's never going to have a positive outcome. So sometimes when you approach an animal, you may not touch it or handle it the first time. You may have to gradually shape their behavior to work with them. You had seen a picture of me when I first signed on, and I'm working with one of my patients named Casper, who's about a 250-pound alligator. And that's an alligator that we have trained. And I can actually do a complete physical exam on that animal, including draw blood. And we don't have to sit on it and tape its mouth shut because it's so well trained and my the people that I work with are such good handlers that I trust them implicitly. I love that the fear free goes across all all, all the animals because Chris and I we actually talked to Lori Chamberlain from uh, Fear Free, and uh, we talked about how we incorporate it into our practices with our patients, so our dogs and our cats, and for me my birds and so forth. And that it actually it applies. You can apply it to any of animals um, and people and people. Right? And it right. makes your life so much easier. And there's too, there's no, there's no fight. I did approach my pug with a fear-free attitude for his exams. And we drew blood from him this year with one person. Wow. <laughs> and that's amazing. If you, that if you understand good. pugs, yeah, yeah, no screaming, no drama. But we conditioned him to it and he consented to it and it made everybody, everybody's life much easier. So it's exciting that it can be applied across the board. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing if, you have the people with the knowledge and the patience, it can be it can be applied across the board. Respect and consent. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up here, I was wondering if you could tell us a final story. And I'm interested in the sea turtle with the prosthetic flipper. Yes. Kathy and I are both rehabilitationists, and we've certainly worked, you know, with orthotics and prosthetics with namely dogs, a few cats and, and so forth. But yeah, this, this was a real endeavor. It took a team, I think. And, and tell me about, uh, you know, your role in this saving the sea turtle's life. Yeah, I have, um, I've been doing sea turtle work now for about 35 years and flipper injuries are fairly common. Uh, they get tangled in ropes and just like the whale tail, uh, if the rope wraps around a flipper, it can cut off the blood supply and they'll lose the flipper. We see frequently, we'll see shark bites and, and that will take a flipper off. And interestingly enough, a lot of these animals do fine with three flippers. This particular animal um, had gotten tangled up in nylon fishing line and its flipper was ripped off. It was treated and released as an amputee, uh, which again is legal. Um, Fish and wildlife have very specific guidelines about what you can and can't release. And then it got stranded again. And then the second time it got stranded, it was badly injured. And then it was deemed non-releasable. So when we brought it into captivity, it was a three-flippered animal. And we noticed that it was struggling swimming. It it was kind of unusual because a lot of animals do really well with three flippers. But this particular one was swimming in circles. And long story short, three graduate students from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute found out about it. And they were all biomedical engineering students. And oh, my God. You talk about amazingly brilliant. They um, wanted to get involved and work on making a biomimetic flipper. And I said, sure. So their level of skill sets and their knowledge level, quantum years ahead of me. And when I read their thesis, I didn't understand 99% of it. But the take home message was they made this flipper that looked and acted just like a real flipper. And it took quite a bit of of research, x-rays, measurements, density studies and you name it and they were able to put this flipper on lolo and we first we first put it on the turtle the turtle didn't know what it was and she kind of sat there like a deer in the headlights by 
45 minutes after we put the slipper on her, she was swimming and acting like a completely normal four flipper turtle. But unbelievable how she adapted to that. That's amazing. I need to see that. <laughs> yeah, if you go online, go to the QS Aquarium, you'll just Google it. You'll see it. You'll see pictures of her. Well, thank you, Dr. Doug. This was so exciting. <laughs> to oh, learn. I hope it was what you were looking for. Yes, oh, and yeah. the stories were fantastic. And as we close, can you let the audience know where can they find you and how can they get your book? Oh, you know, thank you so much for having me with you today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And maybe somewhere down the road, I can come back and we continue some of these stories. If any other readers are interested or listeners are interested, my book is available. Uh, you can get it at some of the big bookstores like Barnes & Noble. Um, it's also available online through online sellers like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books and Books. Um, or you can go to my website, www.dougmater.com. It's pretty easy. And I have links on my website where you can order the book as well. And the title is The Vet from Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. It, it sure is. And I, I've been so humbled that the reception is getting. New York Post made it required reading. Uh, Amazon listed it as a bestseller. Uh, I just got through doing a tour up to Canada where I was on a talk show up there. I've uh, been on NPR radio talking about it. And the feedback I'm getting is this is the first American James Harriet. I couldn't have received a better compliment if I had written it myself. I was just yeah. so humbled when I heard that. Truly amazing to be compared to James Harriet. And, uh, you know, as Kathy said, we were just thrilled to have you learn so much. Uh, you're very uh, fun and easy to talk to. And uh, I hope uh, we can have you back again someday. Uh, let's look forward to that. I really appreciate the invite. And I, I, you guys are great. You're professional. You're fun. You're easy to talk to as well. And thank you so much for making me uh, have such a good time. I really appreciate it. And keep keep uh, saving those key deer and manatees, okay? I certainly <laughs> will. God bless you both. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.